Okay, well, I guess we can get started because I started the recording and if somebody misses it, they can watch the video again. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah, hi guys. Hope you had a good weekend. <laughs> nice to see everybody. This is our last week before spring break. So we want to soak it up. Yes. Yay. I don't want to. I know. Me neither. I really miss you guys. It's too long. Yes. Um, well, just so you guys know, you the quiz that you guys are going to have today, it'll open at 9. So we'll make sure we finish this session by 9. Um, is over China and Russia and then chapters 1 through 5 of Animal Farm. So if you guys have any questions about Animal Farm now, um, this is a good time to ask any. Yep. If anyone wanted to go over the anything from the guided reading questions. Mm -hmm. Anything you're not sure about or you want to clarify. Chat, you can type it in the chat or if you want yeah. to ask, you can ask. Mm -hmm. Everybody feels good on chapters one through five or three through five that you read over the weekend? Very straightforward book. What do we start to see happen with Snowball and Napoleon? Napoleon's kind of taken over. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what, how, what was like their status at the end? What happened to Snowball? They kicked him off the farm. Yep. Good. Good. And so what was the big project that Snowball wanted to do? Of the windmill. Yeah, good. And so after they kick Snowball off the farm, do they continue with the windmill? No. They did eventually. Yeah, eventually they did. Yeah, so they did decide to do it anyways. So what does it say, though? It says that Napoleon was always against the windmill, but then he ends up, after they kick Snowball off, he ends up doing it anyways. So what was the, his reasoning for being against it? What was he trying to do? Oh, I, I don't remember that. Anyone? Didn't he, didn't he just want a reason to get Snowball out of there so he could take control? Like exactly. Yeah. He just wanted to take over control. So he was acting like he wasn't in support of it. But then once they get Snowball out of there, he continues with it anyways. Mm -hmm. Very, Very Stalin-like. Remember Stalin did that yeah. in The Great Purge. Let's get rid of my competition. Mm -hmm. Good. Other mm -hmm. questions about Animal Farm? Okay. Well, for that, um, there are uh, there are 10 questions over chapters one through five on the quiz. They're pretty straightforward. If you read, you should be fine. Um, and I'm gonna ask you to finish reading the next five chapters by Thursday. Um, I'm not, I have the questions that you guys can work on. I just want those finished by Thursday. And then on Wednesday, there's gonna be just a little quick reading check quiz over mm -hmm. chapters six, seven, and eight. So kind of just pace it out a little bit and get those three chapters read by Wednesday and then just make sure you finish it by Thursday. I just want to make sure we have it done before we go on spring break. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat, but yeah, I think we can move on now. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So, so like, um, so like she said, we'll go over those in the next few live sessions that we have. Um, just since this is our last day before break, we are going to have one to the, every day except Friday. So Friday will just be office hours with us at this time um, for you to log in and ask any questions before we go on break or clarify anything. But um, kind of just taking advantage of it because the spring break came so fast on us. <laughs> um, but if you guys right now, um, your quiz is only over one through 16 of the guided notes over China and Russia. But what I'm gonna start to do right now so that it's less for you guys to do on your own um, is I'm gonna actually go ahead and present to you guys um, continuing on for 17, 18, whatever. And then whatever we don't finish, that would be what you guys just need to finish tonight. That's your only homework really is to keep reading and then finish whatever guided notes um, up through, I think it's 25 for tonight that we don't get done right now. Um, so go ahead and grab those notes out and you don't need to have these done. You don't need to have anything written. Um, I might still also ask you guys questions, but you haven't read this yet. So, um, go ahead and turn to those. It should be at the top of a new page. I think number 17 is, um, oh no, my presentation is going slow. So 
we'll pull that up. But we basically talked about, like we said, the rise of Stalin and Mao Zedong. Thank you guys for your primary source um, analyses. I'm um, grading those and returning those to you so you can see my comments on them. Um, but we're going to kind of switch. So those both arose kind of during World War I and soon after it. Um, but we're going to talk about what happens to the rest of Europe. So looking here, which countries emerged from the war financially stable? We want to take a guess which countries were okay post-war. Britain and America. Okay, you got one of them. So Great Britain actually is pretty destroyed after the war, um, just in terms of financially and economically. We don't have like the bombings like we're going to see in World War II, so they're not as physically destroyed. But like in terms of human life and like money, they're actually pretty in debt. But the U.S. actually, you're right, is financially stable good. The U.S. comes out good because remember, the U.S. was only in the war for like a year. OK, mm -hmm. and the whole time they had been trading and selling. So their economy is booming. Um, anyone want to take a guess what the other one is? It's kind of random, but Japan actually comes out pretty financially stable. Um, why do you think Japan's going to be OK? Just take a guess besides it being an ally. They didn't really join until a lot later than the war, maybe. Um. Not, not that, because they were involved. Remember, they wanted to try to get some of Germany's territories in the Pacific, which they get. But they're so far away from the fighting, right? So they're not necessarily... You're going to see again in World War II that a lot of fighting is concentrated in the Pacific. Um, but in World War I, there wasn't as much. And so I think that a lot of times the geography, just the distance, kind of kept them a little bit more intact. Okay, well, we'll see what happens with Japan following this. So post-war Europe, generally speaking, um, as far as human loss and even like financial loss, it was pretty immense. That's why it's known as the Great War. But basically every European country was left bankrupt and financially unstable following the war. OK, and when places are financially unstable, it tends to be connected to politics, OK, which we're going to see. OK, when the economy is good, everybody's happy. They have a job. They have food on the table. They have a little bit of savings. They're able to take maybe a vacation once a year. They're pretty happy. OK, which is why you see even now today. Right. Presidential candidates are always going to refer to the economy because you need people to feel financially stable, to feel secure. Unfortunately, in Europe at this time, everybody was bankrupt. European domination in world affairs is going to decline, actually. So remember before this, that was really the age, the century of Europe. We have the Berlin Conference. We have the Industrial Revolution. We have all these things where Europe is at the top. They're at the height of their power. That's why people like Rudyard Kipling wrote The White Man's Burden, because he's looking around. And he's like, look at Europe. We control everything. We're so rich. We're so smart. We're so technologically advanced. After this war, they start to go down. And actually, the 20th century is known as the, the century of the U.S., right? So this is where the U.S. is going to kind of rise as a political power. Um, so and then European countries, this is a third really important thing. They go through these political changes. So we have this shift, very important, if you want to use that word, a shift from absolute rulers to more democratic governments. OK, so think about the past in Europe. They almost all had monarchies. Now we're going to start to move towards constitutional monarchies, right? Where now we have a constitution and a parliament. We're going to start moving towards real democracies where we have presidents who are elected. Um, the problem is, and this is important to note, Europe in general has little experience with democracy. Um, remember, what was really the only country in Europe that had any form of political representation? Britain. Britain, right? With the Magna Carta, and then you have the English Bill of Rights, and then you have Parliament, which is why the United States, when it was formed as a country, was like, let's take what Britain taught us and go further. Everybody else, though, historically, is very much an absolute ruler. People are not used to having political power. And so you can't just all of a sudden switch to a democracy and expect everybody to understand like how it is to be in a democracy which we'll see. Um, so this is really important to keep in mind. Europe does not really have a history of democratic governments. Some democratic ideas, yes, but not democratic governments specifically. Okay, so really important. Some of you have probably been wondering what happens to Germany. 
Well, remember that the Kaiser flees. He steps down. He's mutinied by the soldiers. He leaves. And they establish what's known as the Weimar Republic, um, which is a democratic government in Germany. But it comes fairly weak for a lot of reasons. And you can bullet the reasons. Why was the Weimar Republic, right? This would be maybe a short answer question. Why is the Weimar Republic um, a weak government? One, just like other European countries, Germany was not known for having a democratic tradition in their history. Um, remember, we have people like Frederick the Great um, and these military leaders who were absolute rulers. Their people have not had representation in a democracy or in government. Um, second problem, and this is a problem we're going to see in a lot of European countries that the United States does not have, um, we have problems because we only have two, but other European countries have a lot of political parties. And so then nobody is ever able to really get a majority, right? So think about in the United States, we only have two political parties. When you guys take APAS, you'll see why. It's actually because the founding fathers wanted there to be no political parties. So they tried so <laughs> hard to prevent them from being formed that only two were able to emerge. Okay, but in Europe, we have the exact opposite. We have a ton of political parties. And so nobody ever really gets a majority. OK, and we see that in we see that actually in Israel, they just have re-elections in Britain. They've had them before where they have to hold the elections multiple times because nobody gets the majority. So they don't know who is actually like the majority in power. Um, so that makes it really difficult to reach agreements in the United States. We can say, OK, 51 percent to 49, which is that really a majority? Technically, yes, but um, it's not, you know, half the country. Effectively. It does What's essentially, that? so like effectively, there's two right. separate problems. If you have two parties, there's too much of a range within them for them to come to their own consensus and there's mm -hmm. infighting. But if you have too many parties, there's never a majority and you end right. up with Brexit. Exactly. No, exactly. Or like I said, the re-elections in Israel where they had to hold them multiple times because there was never a majority. Exactly. There's problems on both sides, right? So what's the ideal number of political parties? I don't know. One of you guys should become a political scientist and, and maybe do a dissertation on that and decide what would be the best in the country. Um, but the third reason why the government was so weak, the Weimar government, is because a lot of the Germans blamed the Weimar government, not the Kaiser, for their defeat in the war, which some of you are like, that's stupid. They were not in power. No, but the Weimar government was in power during the Treaty of Versailles. And so they're the ones who signed the Treaty of Versailles. It wasn't the Kaiser. And so all of the humiliation, remember the war guilt, the reparations, um, losing all of their colonies, they blame that all on the Weimar government, which in its defense, didn't really have a choice, right? They'd been defeated and um, they were kind of at the mercy of the allies. But basically it caused Germans to be very distrusting and um, negative towards this new Republic. On top of that, that's on the political side. On top of that, there's really high inflation during the war and it's compounded by the debt from the war and the reparations that they now have to pay. You can't fix inflation. This is the problem. Who can who can describe for us what inflation is again, for people who don't know, so they can jot down a, a little definition. Um, it's basically where so much money is going through circulation in the economy that its worth gradually goes down. Yep. Good, because all of the money that we have, you guys, like paper money, is backed by gold and silver, right? So what happens is, is you can think, well, we don't have that much money, just print more money. But the problem is, is that, like Nathan just said, when you have more money without it being backed, its value slowly goes down, okay? Or and that's quickly. what they did. What's that? Or quickly. Right. Depending on and how much you print. Right, right, right. But so what happened during the war was Germany was like, we'll just print a ton of money because we're, we need to pay for this war. And um, there's actually, a, um, I should have put it in here. There's a funny picture of German kids after the war playing with blocks of money as if they were like wooden blocks and building like a little castle. Right. So like those little blocks you used to play with as a kid, they were using like bales of money, like little things of money to play with that because money had no worth, right? You would need to take a wheelbarrow full of money to the um, market in order to buy bread. Okay. And so that on top of it, this is the fourth reason why the Weimar Republic is, is really weak. People lost faith in the government because the government couldn't fix it. And in their defense, it's really hard to fix inflation. Um, you have to go through a lot of economic processes to get out of it. 
But also, you know, they only have so much they can do. Um, this is an important thing to note. So the U.S. says we need to help Germany. Remember, the U.S. did not want to punish Germany as harshly as Britain and France did. So the U.S. says, OK, there's a guy named Dawes. Um, he's a politician in the United States. The Dawes plan basically says we're going to give a $200 million loan from American banks to the Weimar Republic in order to stabilize the currency, basically to fix inflation a little bit, strengthen the economy, and set a schedule for debt payment. So the U.S. does do that. And the U.S. actually, you're going to see after World War II, also provides a lot of loans to Europeans as well um, to fix up the economy. So they do this. And it's make a note, this is successful. Okay, This helps people's faith in the Weimar Republic starts to go up a little bit. Um, the economy is kind of getting back on track, right? This is all going in like a positive direction. Notice here that in 1925, France and Germany, who you could argue might have actually been like the real starters of the war just because of their constant rivalry, um, sign a pact not to make war, to respect each other's borders, because remember, part of the reason the war started was because of Alsace-Lorraine. And then the following year, 1926, Germany is admitted to the League of Nations. And you're thinking, okay, everything's on the way. Everything is going really well. The German government is getting back on track. We have a democracy now. They're paying off their debts. Inflation is um, stabilized. They're in the League of Nations. You know what? Seven years after the Treaty of Versailles, things are going well. Uh, Japan also, by the way, is admitted um, around this time. They sell, the, everybody signs this pact not to make war. Okay. What goes wrong then? No one really pays attention to the East at this point in time. And Japan starts to do some weird stuff. And then Italy okay. is over there yeah. with Mussolini yeah. starting to come into like, For the sure. picture. Well, so you're absolutely right. She, everything she said is, is we're going to take notes on a second. I would actually say that happens later. What really kind of catastrophic event happens that makes all of this progress being made after the war go to nothing? <laughs> Anybody want to take a guess here? This question the might Great help you. Depression. Good. Very good, Shane. The Great Depression. So yeah. but notice here the, the years. 26, Germany's admitted to the League of Nations. The, the Weimar Republic has been in power, look, for exactly 10 years. So 1919. 10 years later, the world is sorting itself out again. And we have the start of the Great Depression in the year 1929. That's a really important year just for you to know in America, in, not in America, in world history. Um so in 1929, we have the Great Depression hit. Now, some of you are thinking, but the Great Depression just happened in the United States. The Great Depression may have started there and had its roots in the United States. But, and this is a quote from your book, a very important quote. In the late 1920s, American economic prosperity largely sustained the entire world. Think about the Dawes plan. Think about the loans I just told you that the U.S. is making to European countries. If the U.S. goes under, right, the whole world's economic system might collapse. And unfortunately, in 1929, that's basically what happened, right? Everybody was so dependent upon the U.S. because of the very first question I asked you starting this presentation, what was the, which countries came out financially stable, okay, the U.S. So unfortunately, they kind of were like this domino effect where when the U.S. fell, everybody started to fall. So, um, what were some of the causes of the Great Depression? When you guys take APAS in two years, we actually go into some pretty in-depth studies of the causes of it. It's very complicated, right? Probably not until you go to college and even beyond then will you really understand it because it's very like economic based. But here are just a few reasons. So the uneven distribution of wealth is a start, okay? Businesses now, so this is post industrial revolution we have businesses but we're, we're entering what's sometimes known as the second industrial revolution um where you have like cars and televisions right like other things like that come airplanes but businesses are overproducing goods okay factories are producing way more clothes way more cars way more you know consumer goods um because the economy is doing well um and so we have a surplus not only of consumer goods like from factories, but also of agricultural products. Farmers are producing way too much food and they're not able to sell it all, okay? There's less consumption in the US for a variety of reasons. Um, and on top of that, we have what you guys probably know from 1929, which is the speculation on the stock market. So 1929 is just when the stock market crashes. All of these things that you're listing right now 
were happening well before the stock market crash. The stock market crash was kind of like, actually, this is a good metaphor. The stock market crash was like the Franz Ferdinand being assassinated, right? That was like the tipping point, the like shock to the world on one day. But everything that had been building up to it was already present in the economy for years. The last thing is the lack of regula regulation in the economy. So what was happening is banks were making loans that were not being regulated. Banks were not backed up by anybody. So if a bank went under, right, you just lost all your money. Okay. Which is very, very hard right now. Today you invest your, you guys put your money or your parents put money into a bank account. Um, the government insures that money, which basically says if this bank fails, we've got you covered. Okay. Um, we didn't have that at the time. So you took, like you put a lot of faith into putting, you know, uh, your money into a bank. Um, some people say that like older people, so maybe not your grandparents, but like maybe my grandparents are a little bit older. Um, when they pass away and people go through their house, sometimes they'll find money hidden all over the house or like under the mattress because people lost faith in banks at this point. They were like, we're not going to put our money in there anymore. We're going to put it under a mattress in a sock, you know? And so they'll find money sometimes lying around the house because, you know, that's, that was the reality of growing up in the depression after that. Um, so the great depression, again, starts in the U S but becomes global for the reason I just told you guys, everybody is dependent on the U S at this point. Okay. This is the beginning of the 19th century or 20th century. Sorry. Um, and so the great depression becomes global. Okay. Um, so Americans, are freaked out and this causes global chaos. Okay, it's really interesting that we're going through this right now with the coronavirus because everybody's always saying, don't panic, don't cause alarm because when you cause alarm, it turns to chaos because people are scared. It's just a natural human reaction, right? Um, so bankers- Especially, the that God. seems to be our specialty throughout history, finding a crisis and then immediately panicking it's like as soon as the stock market went down and the wealthy investors were like, oh, no, now it's our problem. Mm -hmm. That's when they started panicking. And everyone else is like, wait, this is new to you guys. We've been in debt for about right. 14 years now. Right. No, that's actually that's very true. Yeah. Uh, the rest of Europe has been struggling. So when the U.S. is like, no, no, we need to stop. Europe's like, wait, wait, wait. No, no. We're all we're just barely getting you know together. You're right. So the bankers who've now lost their banks, demand that the, the European countries pay back their loans. Part of the reason we actually had this global crisis is because bankers were making loans that were not, um, that didn't have collateral to back them, right? Um, or that were not, you know, smart loans. So they're saying to businesses in Europe, you need to pay us back right now. We don't have money. And the bankers and the, the, the people that they loan to in Europe, the companies are like, no, 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 we don't have enough. We're still getting out of debt because of the war investors withdraw their money from European businesses. So those businesses that are just starting to get back on their feet fail. Okay. The American market for European goods drops sharply. So this is really important. They're going to stop buying European goods because they're going to say, no, we need to buy American because that's the only way to keep people. That's the only way to keep our companies, right? American companies from failing. So what the U S government does um, is they put high tariffs on imported goods. So remember, imported means that they're coming in from another country, okay? So from Europe specifically, um, that continent. What is a tariff? What's another word for a tariff? Tax. Good, a tax. So right now, if you buy something from another country, so Congress is allowed to tax imports but not exports. So they put this huge tax on tariffs. So if the European country will make a really simple thing, they want to sell something for $10. With the tariff, it's now $12. So you're probably not going to buy that good because there's another American good that's $10. So you're going to say, I'll buy the American good because $12 versus $10, that's $2 that I don't want to spend. So they were hoping that this would help American companies, right? Sell their American goods. Why do tariffs, and this is actually just an economic principle you need to keep in mind. Why does this policy backfire putting tariffs on imported goods? Take a guess. Would it be because it seems to like arbitrarily raise the value of other goods? 
No, although yeah, I'm sure that has a part in it for sure economically. But there's even a people tend to look at things and say like, right, oh, it's, say it, I don't want to buy that. Or... It must be better. No, that's not although typically why. But that's a good people didn't thought. do that. Right. It's sort of time. like the 2008 crash where the same thing happened with banks, where they just um, decided to loan without the backup. Yes. No. This is very similar to what happened at that time. Yes. There's Definitely. kind of a fear that that's going to happen again now as you see everything start going downhill. Maybe. Hopefully there's regulation in place that would prevent that. But um, but the reason why this backfires, and this is really important to note, when you put tariffs, so say you put tariffs on goods coming from England, what do you think England is going to do? Place tariffs back. Put tariffs back. It's reciprocal. So European countries were like, fine, we'll just put tariffs on American goods and just buy European goods. And so it starts this like back and forth, like, no, you did that. Fine. I'll put a higher tariff. No, fine. I'll put a higher tariff. And it's, it's backfires because then um, basically nobody is trading anymore. Okay. Nobody, everybody, all the trade is put on hold because now you're no longer buying from foreign um, goods and this global economy that they've constructed now is no longer working. So notice here, the next point, world trade drops by 65%, which causes further downturn because yes, they're selling to Americans. Okay. To keep the American companies working, but Americans don't have money right now. Okay. So these businesses are still failing. Okay. Um, unemployment soars around the world, highest unemployment um, that they've experienced in history. European countries that were um, dependent on American loans and investments due to war debts um, are going to go under. Um, particularly Germany and Austria are hit hard. Why would those ones be hit hard? Because they had to pay reparations. Yep. They were the ones who were the central powers, right? So they've, by the Treaty of Versailles, have, are being punished right now. Um, and so they are really suffering. Um, Latin America also, which um, exports sugar, beef, copper, their demand drops. So Latin American countries are going to suffer. It really becomes global. Okay. And you're going to see, we're going to pause here, but you're going to see when you guys continue reading to finish the notes that everybody kind of responds in a different way. OK, some countries respond and they're able to maintain their democracy, maintain kind of their political stability. And other countries um, are not going to react that way because people are scared and insecure and um, lacking the resources that they need to sort of survive. So they're going to turn to some more extreme ideas, again, because of fear. And I think economic fear is probably the biggest driving factor for people. Um, so. Just in the interest of time, you guys are going to continue. Um, can anybody just tell me what number did we make it up to on the guided notes? Anybody know? Um, I think we made it to about 22, maybe 23. Perfect. So you guys are going to keep reading. I'll upload. I just realized it's not uploaded now. I'll upload the PDF for chapter 15. No, this is in 14, I think. No, it's in 15. Yeah, it's in 15. So I'll upload that for you guys. Just finish up through 25. So you only have like three more questions to do um, and the things with it. So continue those notes. And when we check in on the live session tomorrow, we'll finish reviewing those and then we'll start again on the next section. So I don't want you guys to think that you have way more homework this week. Like when you look at the, the weekly agenda and be like, oh my gosh, that's so many notes to do. We're actually going to do those together in class. And then like today, whatever we don't finish, you'll just finish. So if you want to work ahead because you have time, that's fine. Just know that I'll be going over all of them for you guys. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? Just so you know, none of this is on the quiz. Okay. Everything we did today, not on the quiz. The quiz is officially open now. So um, please just set aside your notes. Take that like you guys are in class. It's a Google form. Um, and it's only going to be open until 11. So pretty much everybody should take it right now, just in case you have a third period class that starts at 9.53. Okay. Any questions? All right, guys, then have a great day. Thanks for coming. Bye, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Yeah, we'll Bye. see you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye. Peace out. Good luck on your quiz. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, guys. Is yeah. Is the live stream at 8.30 again tomorrow? Um. Yes, we put it at 8.30. Is that okay? Okay, okay thank you. Okay, you're welcome, dear. Bye. <laughs> Just to use as much time as possible. Yes. Let me turn off the recording before we see. Um, hmm.